we've delayed and also of course for coming on short notice I found it necessary to have uh, a chat with uh, a big number of you and I'm told you are quite a number today and the main reason is to explain a few things first of all about myself and then uh, other important issues especially as we affect the 2021 elections First of all, you must be aware that uh, I was rudely disrupted and held in Rizira for almost two months. And on leaving Rizira, I had quite a number of things to attend to. One of them was my health, to make sure that I put myself back on the road. And of course, I'm doing some checkups. I have not come to the end of that road, but uh, as at now, at least I'm able to speak to you without any, you know, known problem. The second point, I was. Uh, given bail terms. These bail terms are largely limiting and as you may know they affect your movement, they affect uh, even your capacity to communicate. Then of course uh, on returning from Ruzira I got to see a bit of change of circumstances, especially with yourselves. I did not find the media as uh, smooth riding as I left them. I am told there are many reasons for this, but let it be on record that I did not find you as available as uh, was the case. In fact, some of the cases People come and uh, record you and the important things are not necessarily reflected and they pick out few things among us, the many you would have uh, brought out and uh, that's what they choose to flash. When I ask they say it is editorial policy. I don't want to really go into those matters but uh, where necessary, I may have to bring out a very outright open complaint. Now, there was also that the, the typical Ugandan case, when you get these kind of problems, your forces disintegrate. Of course, most of the people I was meeting with at that time were arrested, including a, a member of parliament, Honore Onyakecho, and they were held for some time. So, reassembling them it takes a bit of time, I must also say. Now, there is also that we define tactics. For example, me, I believe, yes, you need publicity, but you must have foot soldiers on the ground. And it's my old skill, some of you have dealt with for so long. We knew then, as we know now, that the Electoral Commission works from seven. And we are not banking on it, we are banking on the people of Uganda. There is a law established that provides for free and fair elections. That is what we demand, that is what we are going to get. We don't exp if we don't get it from the Electoral Commission, we shall give it to ourselves. If Museveni and Biabakama and all the, his other people that he's using to stifle for the voices of the people of Uganda persists, we shall resist. We shall resist them and push them to observing the law as it is. And I must be very assertive on this. We are not going to boycott. Yes. Because 
This is our right. It is engraved in the law, and we are going to make sure the law is observed to the T. For power seems to be at advantage on social media. Yes, but I must tell you that social media is just a small monitor screen of what happens within the population and all over the world. What you see on social media is just a small fraction. It just shows you what's within the people. And those are the few people that have the privilege of accessing social media. The privilege of having a smartphone, the privilege of buying data, and yes, the privilege of being able to pay the OTT. So it is not about we as the People Power Movement. It's about the people of Uganda, all the people of Uganda. Our effort is not to satisfy ourselves. Our effort is to make sure we reach the most rural person because they are just as entitled as those that have the privileges of social media. So we are going to meet people anyway, whether through social media or otherwise. I mean, social media has already showed you that we are a step far from Museveni. We want to show the same on ground because people are waiting for us and we are going to go there. About how we are going to the 2021 elections. I have seen, uh, for example, I've just been uh, discussing with UPC members. I can see the elaborate issues about the law has been set. Essentially, you cannot change elections without even the method of campaigning without changing the law and i would want to first of all you know discuss an important issue about covid this is the reason why we cannot conduct a full-fledged election isn't it now my main question is then what is it about this covid is it a normal situation? Is it not? If it is not a normal situation, what does the law say about a situation that is not normal? Because this is a pandemic. I'm sure everyone of you knows. If it was not so, like Jesus said, then you need not have cared to shift the method and processes of a normal campaign. If you've changed it, it means there is something which is not normal. Now, if this thing is not, if what is not normal is not normal, then what else is supposed to be done? The law is very clear about it. Because I heard something about uh, uncertainties, I don't know. But let me raise some very important points. Who has powers and control over this pandemic? Are you watching what is happening in India? Are you watching what is happening in Brazil? Are you watching what is happening in the United Kingdom? These are developed, organized societies. Have you heard, for example, that 800 Nigerian doctors and medical staff are already pos tested positive? Now, if we had 800 uh, medical staff, professionals, the frontliners, as we now proudly call them, if they all got affected, for example, how would you run this country? The other question I want to raise is, uh, do we have any controls over COVID? Especially that we are now getting scattered cases of what they call community infections. You are talking about ranging from Buikwe to now Rakai and of course Amur and other places. But then the next question is, when it is in this kind of circumstances, how much control do you have about what can spread and what can spread? We have neighbors. These neighbors manage COVID in different ways. For example, one leader is of the view that is, this is not a very big matter. That actually it is a cough like any other. Now my main question, you know our porous borders. 
You know that the kakwa has spread into southern Sudan. You know that it has spread into Congo. Who told you these people really know what the borders are all about? Do they know? Their cousins are married here. They are brother. It is like so South and North Korea. When you see people in South Korea throwing food across, they are throwing it what used to be like Naguru and Kororo. Yes, just because that the borders were decided in a certain way. So then the next question is, if I am sick, I think the most important thing is where I get treatment. It's not my geographical or nation description that matters. It is where, if I'm a Sudanese and I am sick, do I have to go to my own country? When Ugandans are sick, they go to India, isn't it? So if I have a neighborhood where I have suspicion they are, that there are better medical facilities, where would I go? Then the next question is, can you tell who is a Sudanese and who is a Ugandan? If they all speak the same language? Can you tell who is a Congolese and who is not if they speak the same language? And you are aware that we had a vice president in Kenya and a minister in Uganda who are actually brothers? Because these are facts we can only live with. We can, but then said and done, how much control do we have over these problems? Now, there is... We will be telling people the actions as they develop. Many of them are going to be guided by us, but yes, very many of them are going to be guided by the ordinary men and women of Uganda. This is a revolution, if I must announce it now. Um, about the manhandling of uh, my brother Butcherman, our spokesperson ably said that we like to minor on minors and major on majors. But again, I want people to know that Butcherman is my brother. And that is why I'm using this very special time to communicate not just to him, but very many other friends, brothers and sisters in the same line. Always remember that a dictator will use you when he needs you and dump you like he has done to the rest. You have seen what they did to Kakoza Mutale. You have seen what they did to Chitata, my brother. You have seen what they did to Blight Wine. You've seen what they did to Sergeant Chifurugunyu. Okay? You have seen what they did to Kaihura. And painfully, you saw how General Kasiri Gwanga ended. So my brother, wake up. You've seen what happened to people like Tomokonde. You're not any different. We are fighting for Uganda that makes sure it secures the right of the powerful and the weak. That is why we want fairness and justice. There are some of these people out of these COVID issues who are so much more concerned about financial survival than about even their health. I remember when I addressed, uh, I addressed uh, NTV, who cheated most of my interview, really. The, the, the Chikubo was full, packed, and running. The circumstances of Chikubo, I'm struggling with you here to do social distancing. How can you do social distancing in school? That's why I was even saying that maybe we should open centers in different corners of the, of the roads that enter Kampara that we may then be able to manage these, you know, transactions and the processes of trade in those areas. But even then, how long does it take? Then there is also... Uh, if this country had an emergency, as is likely to be the case, because now World Health Organization is telling us categoric that we are waiting for now the most difficult phase, which other people have entered in, how prepared are we? And if this comes in between an election, what happens? We shall have purchased things, we shall have... Uh, procured using public funds, individuals will have invested their monies in an election, 
we shall all have done preparations. If there is need, for example, to do another lockdown, how do we relate it to this pressure of rushing for an election? How are you going to, you know, interface them? That's also another important question. Then there is also elections in their own nature, as at before. For example, in the last election, for example, you know very well that the electoral material reached to Wakiso here, 2 o'clock. Now, if there is social distancing, if there are all these many now encumbrances, including a curfew, which eats of three hours of our day, because you are rushing to catch up with the traffic, now, if there is now delivering all these materials to different centers, how are you going to do it? How easy will it be? I have not seen any amendments in the law that provides that we shall vote for three days. I have not heard about that. But if in normal circumstances we are finding it difficult to deliver these materials on time, what happens? Let me give you a joke and you don't want to take it too far. It's a joke. You know Electoral Commission will be working very close together. Don't you know that? Like you are here now. They will be running around. What if we get a case of the chairman of Electoral Commission? This is a joke. And others getting uh -huh, the, the, the COVID-19. What happens? You know how long it takes to actually recoup an Electoral Commission? and maybe you would have disbanded parliament. How do you get an emergency team? For example, the Prime Minister of Uganda, I don't know what the, 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 the results are with his self-isolation. I am very happy that he was honest enough to say, let me take sides until I'm sure. Now, if the chairman of the Electoral Commission suspected COVID and took sides, and maybe some senior elements of it, does the Electoral Commission remain the same or not? If it is not the same, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to reconstitute the Electoral Commission? You know the processes of reconstituting an Electoral Commission. Why the hurry? Why are you rushing? Now I'm taking you into the nitty gritty so that we can really get to understand some of these things very carefully. Let me also say that, for example, this happens. You have to amend the law. You have to constitute the Electoral Commission, and then what happens? How long will this take? How long will the process take? You know, I want us to look into these things, and then we should always answer the important question. Our of Uganda, I salute you for staying firm, even at a time like this, when our nation is standing on a very shaky ground. Today, we come together Yet again, when our nation is facing one of the greatest contradictions of our time, the blood of men and women who paid the ultimate price to make sure that there is a restoration of democracy in Uganda is crying out and crying out loud. It continues to call upon the unfulfilled promises, the broken promises and the blatant lies that have been ongoing in our country. We have seen this throughout the 35 years, the 35 years of blood and tears under the repressive regime of blood and tears under President Museveni. When he moved to remove the age limit from the Constitution and crown himself president for life, it began as a joke. In fact, he initially dismissed it. He denied it in the beginning but it took only a few weeks before the parliament was raided. Members of parliament were bribed and some of our people were killed fighting for the survival of the remaining of our constitutional order. Many of the Ugandans, you and I, thought that this was the last, I mean the worst we had seen. Nobody believed that there was any worse anybody would do to stay in power. But now, we all see that a dictator will go to any height and any depth to keep in power. Museveni, like all dictators before him, 
is determined to keep in power at any cost. He does not care what happens to Uganda or Ugandans for as long as he still occupies State House. Fellow Ugandans, I'm reminding you that Museveni is at it once again. He recently met the Electoral Commission and he gave them orders to organize what he called a scientific election. Using the coronavirus as an excuse, he is banning public rallies and other aspects of a normal election as we all know them. I want to tell you that no Ugandan should be fooled into believing that Museveni is doing this for the safety of Ugandans. Because as we speak right now, most urban places are filled with people. No social distancing, no nothing. And if you want to prove the words I'm saying, you go to Chikubo, go to Natete, or go to any urban center that you can reach first. We have seen normal elections going on, ladies and gentlemen. We've seen them in Malawi, we've seen them in Burundi, and as we speak right now, in America, a place that is much more affected by the COVID-19 pandemic is having elections this year in 2020, and they're having normal elections. In fact, yesterday, the US president was holding a public rally. Therefore, we should not be fooled, and Ugandans should not be taken for fools. As you all recall, ladies and gentlemen, there was no coronavirus when our consultation meetings were stopped. There was no coronavirus when Museveni personally ordered for the blocking of all our shows. So we must all by now be knowing that what Museveni fears are the people and not the COVID-19. He is hiding under the COVID-19 now just like he was hiding under the Public Order Management Act then. He fears the people. He does not want us to reach the people. Therefore, nothing, I mean, there is nothing like a scientific election, ladies and gentlemen. For us, what we are going for is a real election, a real election as envisaged by the law of Uganda, a real election as prescribed by the Constitution of Uganda. Ladies and gentlemen, a free and fair election means that everybody who has a right to vote can actually go and vote without being blocked, without being influenced by bribes or intimidation. It means all candidates are given equal opportunity to convey their messages to the voters so that the voters can make an informed choice. I've said this before and I will say this again, that I on behalf of the millions of oppressed and exploited Ugandans will be taking on President Museveni in the forthcoming election, which we expect to be in six months. <laughs> Let me say this again. I, on behalf of the millions of oppressed and exploited Ugandans, will be taking on Museveni in the next presidential election in 2021 conduct an election and in any case is it the most important thing we must do yes there is also for example uh, you are saying that we are going to compete for your airwaves and I saw the minister of ICT proudly talking about 309 uh, radios we thank God for that, that Uganda is so communicable. But I want to ask you some fundamental question. Who owns these media outlets? Do they belong to the government of Uganda? And in any case, can I also ask another technical question? Who tells you that what belongs to the government of Uganda belongs to the Independent Electoral Commission? Who appoints the Board of Governors of, 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 of UBC? Is, is it any of you? They are appointed by a minister of ICT. What if the rules apply that he who calls the piper calls the, the, the tune? What happens? In short, I'm saying, let's be more precision. The Independent Electoral Commission does not have 
all the powers about, above, about UBC. They don't. Anyway, let's even say that, for example, I, I had uh, uh, Mr. Ofono Pondo saying that uh, they, are, they are going to enact laws. I don't know when this will be. Which enacting of laws? Which laws are good enough to tell me to bombard into the doors of NTV and start addressing people? This NTV belongs to some people. Those of you who, blow, who, who, who work there, you know, it has got editorial policies. It's got, even if government was to pay, if government pays, or if the electoral, sorry, if electoral commission was to pay, who has paid? And how does this give you any special assurances? Let's assume they pay. And then who controls the programming? You know yourselves. Are you sure your editors know everything you do? Are you sure your board members know everything you do? Don't you have personal interest yourself? By the way, I also have to use this opportunity to mention that our, our usual jurists, our usual fighters in these crusaders, in this battle, are now, I'm sure, compromised by the fact that this money may go to media houses and therefore may accrue some of you. So we have lost a great fighting force. The revolutionary force of the media is now fairly, I'm sure, divided in this opinion. And one of the points I'm sure they must be saying, if this money comes to us, some will trickle to me. But anyway, in any case, assuming that was not the case, what if there is an arrangement between an editor? We are not above it, are we? Between an editor and... Uh, some political group who have critical influence. What happens? And okay, let's say even you force me, because UCC has some powers, you force me and say, Tumukunde must come. I say, thank you very much, Mr. Tumukunde, welcome. The only time available is midnight, when everybody has slept. What are you going to do about it? Or if you become more forceful, for example, I will say the machines are not working. Yeah, I'll call the engineer and say, how, how is the process of uh, those machines working? The man will keep saying, we have failed to repair, we have failed to repair. And in any case, with these volumes of, I'm told yesterday, Romshana added himself on the list of presidential candidates. So when I went to electoral commission, they told me they were 22. So I, I hope now they are 23. Okay, divide them time. In this short span of time, and you know very well we are only allowed to campaign. Even time has been reduced. It used to be three. You can the, 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 the paradox is when we can't campaign as smooth as we did, that is even when time is reduced. How are you going to distribute all these people onto these media houses? How about your coverages? Are you sure you, you do national coverage? You don't. Most of you cover regional or sometimes tribal linguistic zoning. Yes, that's also true. You know these radios and you know the influences. Of course, I should also tell you that most of these radios are owned by politicians. I can use Jinja as an example. One is owned by Mr. Warieku, another one is owned by Onare Warieku, another one is owned by Onare Nabeta, another one is owned by Onare Mwiru. Now, assuming, these are my friends, assuming critical times come and they say don't allow an opposed man to NRM to speak on your radio. What more powers do you have over here, over Bariyeku's radio? Who are you? So let's get down and really look at this integrities. So we have like 10,000 candidates. If you allow electoral commission, I mean, if you allow uh, LOCs and others, how are you going to split them? And how are you going to make sure that each of them is truly, you know, accessing this? That is to start with, if you can. Because this is a private ownership. This is my shirt. You can't come and tell me, wear it upside down. I will say, no, it's mine. I have the rules. That's how I want to dress it. Now, there is also, who determines how much time you are okay to? And then we've got so many languages in Uganda. If in every case I've got to have a translator, 
what happens. Even the little time has, has been given to me when I'm in, a, uh, you know, Sebei sub area, I have got to get a translator. So the little time I have has got to be divided between me and the translator. I hope this translator will be understanding English very well because you do not have the opportunity of choosing them on ground using your supporters. Have you ever heard about the joke of uh, a Muganda who was starting, I mean, a Muzungu who was starting to preach uh, here some Christianity? And he said, Who knows? And the Muganda translator said, Enyindo Zanibanang. God knows, Enyindo Zakatonda. So you can see the disfrequency. I'm sure you must have seen Zuma's translator. This one of, of the, 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 the deaf and uh, hearing impaired. The man was dancing like this. Zuma thought actually he was translating very well. What happens? These people are the ones who say, this man, what he's speaking, we don't understand. Imagine including the body of, of Mandela. So when, even for me, when I see this, I imagine that this is the thing. Because I don't know the language, it's a language. So assuming you have translators and you are sharing time and they are not even effectively delivering your message. I'm taking you deep into this matter that beyond here we may have, you know, time to look into these things. And it's for once to take these matters very serious. This government is here because there was a mismanaged direction. It may have been used as an excuse, as some people say, but it's because there was a mismanaged direction. So the next question is, do we want to repeat this? Do we want to repeat this? Go to our neighborhoods here, in the East African community. See the kind of prices that are being paid, although there are too many views about why one leader could have died and another, but you see, the whole essence is that when people are competing for votes, it is like people struck, struggling for food. If your candidate is about to win, do you want to tell me that social distances will matter? Do you want to tell me that you won't enter houses in search of votes at night? Do you want to tell me that coffee will work? I am not too sure, especially when that temperature has reached certain levels. I am not too sure. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that the Electoral Commission should call all of us. By the way, I was hearing views about any view expressed by opposition is my view. So we don't have to waste time on this, whether everyone has to be, because people are not here, then what I'm speaking is mine, not really. We've got some common ground, common understanding on certain things. So, my main issue is, let the Electoral Commission call us. Let's go through these nitty gritties. Explain ourselves and our views to them, that they may then, you know, choose a correct course that fits all of us. For example, I was hearing another view from one presidential candidate who was saying there is now something called hybrid. Have you heard about that? Yes, my main question is, whose view is this? Is it the Electoral Commission view? I don't know. And you see, there is also, imagine after such deep silence, that's when somebody comes up and shocks you with a roadmap. For all I have said, how many months are many? Just remove December. Are you sure you're going to engage Ugandans in December for, for election after COVID, if we shall have after COVID? Are you going to start lorries that are entering Uganda? Because these are supply lines for some people. Some of them is a life and death matter. Some of them is sheer survival in business. Are you going to stop, stop these lorries? Who has ever researched why these drivers are the ones who have problems? Is it where they sleep? Is it who they pass by when they are coming? Is it about the truck? Is it about the wind when they are driving? 
Is it about the border where they spend? Who has researched this? Nobody. Or is it true that they sleep together when they are planning to do routines? None of this research is appearing in front of us. So, why are we in a hurry? Why are we rushing? Because I'm told there are some constitutional limitations which cause uncertainties. My main question is, how many times have we amended the constitution? For our own sake, the constitution serves us. What if there is every reason? You know, to suspend some articles of the constitution. And the law is very clear before even go to suspension. Once this is an emergency, they tell you what to do. And then that's what for me I think we should rather spend time trying to do than just hushing us and rushing us in an election. So, gentlemen, as far give you a roadmap and even as I came here, I was speaking to another political group in my own circumstances. Afanga Atambura Amagurutegamugaya, for those of you who understand Uganda, that when you die struggling, your, your legs will never say you didn't do enough. So we are still talking, we are still coming. But all this said and done, how much time do we have? And when can all this be compiled in such a, a short time? I had the, the, the chairman of the Electoral Commission this time becoming very Ugandan, saying, uh, Bubu, uh, that is, that is by, build Uganda, by Uganda, uh, no, build Uganda by Uganda, isn't it? Sorry? Ah, okay, buy Uganda, build Uganda. The reverse is also true. But the most important thing, and therefore they are going to print things here. I'm sure you know what happens at, at Nkuruma. You know how many things are printed in Nkuruma? That's why the Electoral Commission was saying, for those of you who don't have documents from original known universities, please take them for you know, certification. You know why? Anyone can print. So now, you know, when I was uh, in Kenya, somebody told me a story. Some people had migrated from the Moi side and joined the opposition. So there came a, a man with a, a, a whole truck with a, a coffin, two coffins actually. And people were crying. So this guy said, mm, from Nairobi? Up to Naivasha, people are still crying so deeply. They said, no, 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 let's check what is here. What did they find there? Barot papers. Because they're crying when they got nearer to the amplified. You know how Africans cry. But then this guy said, mm -mm, this crying is, has a style. Why don't we check on these dead people? On lifting the coffin, the coffin was too light. We are not above some of these things, I'm not too sure we are. So, we can go into all this. Me, my job was to bring you to your notice. And this is my important statement. Let Electoral Commission find importance in the legitimacy and the credibility of an election. Legitimacy, credibility of an election. Once this ceases to be, then you give excuses to very many other things. And we have a history with this country. I am of the view that legitimacy and credibility is very fundamental. You know that every end of an election, we have a court case. And the, ruling, the rulings are always very clear. The rulings is always saying, no, the election wasn't that, but it will not have influenced the result of the election. You know, that's a very interesting statement. Yes, things were not very correct, but it would not have influenced the results of the election. Uh -huh. So, I would want to take on some of your questions. I know you don't have a lot of time for one individual.